My name is Tom Romito, and I am a board member of the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. Where where are you, Sarah? Um, I'm located in Grimes, Iowa. And what state is it? Iowa, Iowa. Iowa. You're yep. real fine. Um, <clears throat> so the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge is near Toledo. And we're okay. a 501c3 nonprofit celebrating our 25th year supporting Ohio's only national wildlife refuge complex. And our main priorities are youth development, public use projects, and land acquisition and restoration. So we're on the southern shore of Lake Erie near Oak Harbor, which is near Toledo, and some of the most critical wetland habitats in the world. And if you're interested in learning more about uh, this refuge and what we do, I put a link in the chat room. In fact, I put three, li three links in the chat room. The first is for our webpage, where you can go on and learn how to become a member if you're interested, make a tax deductible donation to support our work and even shop at our online nature store. And I also put a link in there of our events page, which uh, lists all of the these um, program, these virtual education programs that we've got for the rest of the year that you can register for. And lastly, I put a link in there for a survey that after this presentation, you can take that survey and tell us how you felt and what you'd like to see in these programs. So today I'm joined by presenter Mark Hainan. Um, Mark is in Ohio right now. He's going to talk about a place called Saks Zimbog and how to prepare for it, what to expect when you go there, and what to see. Uh, he is an avid birder and wildlife photographer that divides his time between Northwest Ohio in the summer and Central Florida in the winter. And each fall, he volunteers for two months as an observer at the Detroit River Hawk Watch. For the last eight years, he's visited the Saks Zimbog in northern Minnesota to find an which photograph boreal bird species. Several of, it, several of his photographs have been published and uh, <clears throat> they have been recognized by local, regional and national organizations, including National Audubon Society, Orange County, Florida Audubon Society, Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge and the D Detroit River Hawk Watch. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Mark. The show is yours. Okay, I see there's some people in the waiting room too, it looks like. Gotcha. So, I'm going to take them in, bring them in right now. And I'm going to go ahead and share the screen when you tell me to. Yeah, now is good. Okay, do we have the presentation up? I think we do. You see yes, it there, Tom? I sure do. Well, I appreciate everybody who has uh, joined us this morning, and uh, hopefully a few more will uh, jump in, but uh, the uh, winter birding in the Zaxim bog, and really what I'm gonna focus on here in this presentation is preparing for the actual trip, what to expect, and what you can see. And again, this is during the winter, uh, because it is a very challenging area and can be extremely cold, but at the same time, very rewarding if you are a birder and or a wildlife photographer. As you come into the bog, the bog is basically a square, I would call it square. It's a grid of roads and it's probably 10 miles by 10 miles in size. There are some areas just outside the bog that are also connected to the, the location. And it's not a, what I would call a wildlife refuge in the, in the pure definition. It is a series of uh, grids of roads that include private property and public property that's been slowly acquired over several years by the friends of the Saxon Bog to maintain this the wildness of the area and it is a fairly wild tamarack thick trees bog um, that houses many boreal species during the winter as they come down and migrate south 
to a little warmer temperature if you call minus 28 degrees a warmer temperature. So in preparing for a winter trip, there are some things that are important to know. Uh, December, January, and February are the most popular months during the winter to travel to the Saxon Bog. It's cold. I, I've been there when it's 50 degrees in the middle of the winter, which was very unusual, and uh, minus 40 degrees. But typically the temperatures range from 25 to minus 25, real temperature. And any wind added to that just decreases the feel-like temperature beyond that, and it can easily get down to a feel-like minus 40 degrees. So you need to dress appropriately. If you're in the Ohio area, just to give you an idea of how far it is from Toledo, Ohio, which is Northwest Ohio, it's about a 12 hour drive if you go up through Chicago. If you drive up through Michigan uh, and take the long way up to the UP and across to uh, Wisconsin, it's about 14 hours, but a very pleasant drive if the weather cooperates. I actually come up uh, from Orlando because I'm in Florida during the winter. So we fly into Minneapolis, St. Paul and rent a car there. Some people will fly directly to Duluth, but I have found that to be number one, much more costly. And number two, if you fly, fly into Minneapolis and rent a car and drive up, you usually get there faster. And we stay in Duluth. So it's about a two hour drive to Duluth and another hour north north from Duluth to the bog. So total drive time from Minneapolis is about three hours. And it's fairly easy driving and the roads are well maintained during the winter. Most of your birding during the winter is by car. You know, you, you drive the grids of roads slowly with your wind is cracked because it is cold and uh, you listen and you look and you watch for other people what they're doing. If there's cars stopped along the road. But you do need to take plenty of layered winter clothing and good boots and mittens with you and have them available at all times in your car. I typically, when I'm driving in my car, I leave the windows down a little ways and turn the heater low because I have camera equipment and I want it to be acclimated to the outside temperature. If you bring in a camera in from a warm car to a cold environment, they tend to fog up quickly. So my wife and I will bundle up and everything with hats and mittens and drive around slowly with the windows down. So as I said before, Duluth is about 50 minutes from the bog and that's where we stay. And the reason we stay in Duluth is it's a very nice young town, a lot of young people. We stay at Canal Park, which is right downtown on the waterfront. You're in walking distance of many nice restaurants and there's a lot of hotel selections. However, other people prefer to stay a little bit closer to the bog. Um, and you can find more information about where to stay at the Friends of Sex in Bog website, which is sexzim.org. Two of the towns that are fairly close to the bog, Hibbing, which is 17 miles northwest, and Virginia, which is 25 miles north of the bog. If it's your first time, if you've never been there, in our first time, we actually, they have a festival um, every year in February, towards the middle or latter part of February, and you watch their website for details. Uh, we did that the first time, and that, that we got an opportunity to learn the bog by riding around in big old yellow school buses uh, on field trips. Uh, and it was a great opportunity to kind of get a feel for what the bog was like but from that point forward we have done it we freelanced it and have really gotten quite good at it uh, but however there are some great guides and uh, the guides are listed on the friends of sex in bog web page um, one individual i highly recommend i know him personally is uh, judd brink judd lives in hibbing i think and uh, he knows the area like the back of his hand he's an avid birder he knows his birds He's connected to all the other guides. So when you're with a guide, they know where the birds are. They know where the owls are. They can usually help you find what you're looking for. 
And if it's your first time there, I would highly recommend checking out the guides. And Judd is really reasonable in his costs. But the, for the first time, that's what I would do. Now, just to get an idea of how big the bog is, as I said, it's about a 10 to 15 mile square. Uh, and it's 147,000 square acres or 300 square miles. There's a series of paved and, and stone farm roads that crisscross the area east, west, north, south. Uh, and um, much of the area is private property. 90% <clears throat> of the birding, as I said, is by car because the temperatures are so cold. And to be honest, there are only a few areas that you can actually walk. There are some uh, boardwalks that they maintain, a couple of them. And then there's a nice maintained trail by the actual visitor center, which is what I would recommend the first place you go uh, on Owl Avenue to get a map and to get acclimated to where the roads are. And they usually have a board that people list what they've seen, where they've seen it. So you get an idea of where you can go. Uh, weather can be an issue, but the roads are well maintained. You never, if you're in a car, you never get off the edge of the road because there is no edge. If you drop off, it may look like the shoulder, but it's not. It's a three or four foot deep ditch. And once you're off, you're not going to get out. I don't care if you have a four wheel drive vehicle. Uh, you're not going to get out and you'll need to get a tow. Um, as I said, several there are several maintained boardwalks and trails available for birding. And uh, they're, they're, they're nice to walk, they're quiet, and you get a chance to get a sense of what it's really like out in amongst the trees. But anywhere else, you really can't walk off the road because you step off the road, you go into three or four foot of snow. And it's so thick, the trees, you can't get through them anyways. So as I said, a lot of the birding is done by, by car. So here's a map that kind of shows you uh, Duluth uh, in Virginia, uh, and the bog is that star. And a little blow up of that area kind of shows you the bog's area, which is circled. And then there's a couple of boardwalks uh, listed. Uh, Winterberry Bog has a boardwalk. Warren Nelson Memorial Bog has a boardwalk. And there's a couple of other new ones that are coming on stream. This is the map that you will gather. You can actually print it off from their website or you can pick one up at the uh, visitor center, uh, which is uh, where the uh, purple star is down the left hand corner. That's the Saxeb Bog Welcome Center and it's, uh, they have specific hours and they, and they have specific months that they, main, that they have staff that, that maintain it and answer your questions. But as you can see, uh, this map kind of lays out where to go, what you can see, and kind of gives you a drive-by uh, directions on uh, places to go and how to get there. This is a typical road in the bog. They're straight, they're well-maintained, and they're gravel. And that snow doesn't look too deep there, but it is, is fairly deep snow. They get quite a bit of snow during the winter. It's beautiful. It's a, uh, these, these red uh, willows uh, in the areas where there's not a lot of trees uh, create great habitat for all kinds of birds, rough grouse. Um, you, there's a lot of porcupines uh, around, fox, wolves. Um, I didn't, I've never seen a moose, but there are moose. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, the typical jackrabbits or the snowshoe, snowshoe hares that you see. And it's just a beautiful place when the sun hits these areas at, at the right angle. It's just a wonderful place to, to, to experience even though it's cold. 
Mark, uh, Mark, I'd like to interject something. I'm for the listening audience. By the way, Mark, we're we're privileged to have ten participants now that have come in since you began. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tom Romito, and I'm hosting this program. And I wanted to note that um, in the chat room are three links, and I'd like you to visit them. The one, the first, or just copy them. The first one is the map is the link to the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge webpage to see who we are. The second is our, our the schedule of these virtual programs for this year. And the third thing is a survey that you can take afterwards to uh, give some feedback on this presentation. And now um, you might have questions about for, for Mark, please put them in the chat um, or hold them until the end and as I see them come into the chat, I, I will uh, feed them to Mark. <clears throat> um, the uh, Sarah says that can you repost the links? They 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 are in there. If you scroll up, Sarah, on the chat room, you'll see them at the very top of of it. Let me know if you if you do not see that. So Mark, um, back to you. Thank you. Sure. And again, for those that just joined, uh, the Stex in and Northern Minnesota is a place that I have, my wife and I have visited for the last eight consecutive years. Uh, we go every winter uh, and uh, each year it's a new experience and we really enjoy our time. There is a major train route that runs through the Stex in and it goes along the eastern border of the bog along Highway 7 and the trains just roar up and down that and pulling you know over 100 cars and going very fast. So always be careful when you're out there uh, by these tracks because the trains just show up and they, they, the, they don't stop for anything. Uh, so just uh, be aware of that. There's a, there's a place at the bog, just outside the bog, it's called Augie's Bog. And Augie uh, spends his day carving these cute little owls out of, uh, you know, trees that have been taken down. And he has a box there that he sets them in and anybody's free to take one and just leave a donation and that money goes towards maintaining that specific boardwalk. When I said don't drive off the edge of the road, this is what happens. We drove off the edge of the road. I was too busy watching uh, something in the trees, thought it was an owl. And the next thing I know, my front right tire got augered in and it just took me right into the the deep snow, all wheel drive, I couldn't get out. I waited for three hours. I, the wrecking service finally showed up. It was getting dark and there were wolves howling. So, and there, there was a, several people drove by, but they couldn't do anything to help me. But one gentleman did from Mary Lou's Bird Feeders, which is a place that I'll talk about, drove by and took me to the visitor center where they called the wrecker and then he drove me back. Uh, and uh, so it's very important that you understand the towing services and have them in your wallet, their phone number, so you can make sure if something happens, you can get pulled out because you will not get out on your own. The evening is beautiful too. This is a sunset as we're heading back to Duluth uh, and the skies are just brilliant. Uh, I've never, never experienced the Northern Lights while I was there, but hopefully one day I will. But the sunsets are usually breathtaking uh, and uh, we always enjoy the evening drive back to our hotel. Also would recommend that you pack some power bars or a, a lunch, uh, bottles of water, a blanket that you have with you with all your warm clothing in your car. Uh, just to make sure that if you do get stranded for whatever reason that you have uh, emergency supplies, including a flashlight. My wife and I also spend uh, a good part of our time when we're there each year driving the north shore of Lake Superior, which is also excellent birding and good places to find owls. This is just a shot of uh, 
the shoreline of Lake Superior, which very rarely freezes over. I've seen portions of it frozen, but most of the, the lake is open water, even at minus 28 degrees, because it's such a big lake. Another picture, this is uh, early morning as the, the fog is rising off the water and the sun's coming up a uh, uh, Lake Superior. We usually drive the North Shore from Duluth, it's, it's Route 61, up through a city called Two Harbors. And then up north of that, there's a state park called Gooseberry Falls right on the lake, which has a nice waterfall. And then further up is uh, another state park called Split Rock Lighthouse State Park, which is a gorgeous lighthouse up on a cliff over Lake Superior. And we do a lot of birding. On your way to those two areas, just past Two Harbors, uh, just a recommendation, it's called the Rustic Inn at Castle Danger. If you want a great piece of pie and a good lunch, that's the place to stop. There's another picture of the, just the beautiful photograph, photographic opportunities there are in Duluth. Not only bird photography, but just, you know, landscape photography is just a marvelous in, in that area during the winter. This is Split Rock Lighthouse from an overlook as you're driving towards the park. Now we're getting some of the, the birds. In Duluth, uh, we stay at Canal Park and that's the major entrance for all the Great Lake freighters that come in to unload. They go through Canal Park through a really cool bridge that's an old bridge that lifts straight up in the air. These are common golden eyes uh, and they're everywhere in the winter. Uh, uh, along Lake Superior. These were right outside the hotel. Uh, we were walking along the, the shoreline there, the canal, and there were large groups of these ducks uh, everywhere. Also mammals. Uh, this was at Two Harbors uh, near, they have a park there which has a lighthouse and a uh, and this was down in that area on the lake. We came across a red fox hunting, and uh, here he is uh, finding and pouncing on something. Uh, it, it was too far away to tell what it was, but I think it was probably some kind of a rodent, uh, a mouse or a vole. But they're very common to see. This is another red fox. This is actually north of uh, Two Harbors in the Superior National Forest, which is another place we go. Uh, it's pretty desolate up there, but uh, we always go up there to see if we can see a moose. That's a, that's a good place to find moose. But we found another red fox up in that area one year. Of course, these red squirrels are everywhere there, make a lot of noise and uh, when you're birding on the Saxon bog, uh, you see these squirrels uh, near the feeding stations. And I'll explain the feeding stations in a moment. Also, we have pine martens. This is a pine martin near one of the feeding stations. There are a couple of, uh, the most popular feeding station in the Saxon bog is on a road called Admiral Road. And it's the Admiral Road feeding station. And basically people drive up to that feeding station and just park and just watch all the activity. They spread peanut butter out, they have seeds, they have uh, you know, deer carcasses because a lot of these birds you know, want the fat content. And you do get to see a good variety of birds at these feeding stations. And they're only, the feeding stations are only maintained during the winter in the spring, they take them down and then they put them back up uh, before the season starts. Of course, there are a lot of deer and during the winter, these deer look like they're all swollen, but they just have a lot more fur on them to keep them warm in these frigid temperatures. Porcupines are pretty common. You usually find them like this up in a tree nibbling on uh, you know, the buds of the trees uh, for nourishment. And, uh, and I've never seen one on the ground. I've only seen them in the trees. 
of course, uh, our American symbol is very plentiful in the area. This was actually along Lake Superior near Gooseberry Falls. We pulled off on a overlook and this magnificent bald eagle flew in and, and landed on this uh, top of this small conifer. Uh, and gave some good opportunities for great looks and some some pictures. This is a very common bird in northern Minnesota year round, and uh, it was called the gray jay, but now it's been returned to its original name, which is the Canada jay. They're very they're fairly large birds, about the size of a blue jay. And uh, they're always uh, looking for opportunities to grab something to eat. And uh, they're not afraid of people. Uh, so you'll see a, a lot of these guys if, if you're out and about around the feeding stations. They love to hang out at the feeding stations in the bog. And those feeding stations are all listed on the map that you get at the uh, visitor center. Of course, the uh, hairy woodpecker is another common bird that you see at feeding stations and at, on the boardwalks and some of the memorial bogs like Warren Nelson bog in the trees. Very similar to a downy, but uh, you can tell it's a hairy by its size and the length of its beak, which is much longer than a, a downy woodpecker. Uh, downy woodpeckers are also common there. This is a fun bird. Um, you usually hang out in the south part of the bog, southeast corner, there's some, there are some cattle farms. And these black-billed magpies like to hang out around the cattle. And they're size of a crow size, uh, really long tail, pretty skittish, but they are fun to watch and fun to see and they're very colorful. Here's another picture of a black-billed magpie in a tamarack tree. Rough grouse are everywhere. And uh, you'll see them, many times you'll see them on the road uh, because they're eating the grit uh, for their gullet to help digest their food. And so they're, they're out in the road picking up stones and you'll see them in the bushes or along the road nibbling on uh, anything that looks like uh, nourishment for them. And they're pretty calm. I mean, if you roll up slowly when you see one, they usually don't scatter. Uh, they usually just continue on. If you get out of your car, they'll take right off. So I use my car as a blind and it works well. And uh, you can roll quietly up on some of these uh, grouse and uh, get some really nice looks in our pictures. There's also uh, uh, sharp-tailed grouse in the area, uh, and they're not as common. And they're also spruce grouse, uh, which are really hard to find. So these are, this is a pine grosbeak, a, a male. And uh, the male, the pine grosbeaks, they come down in the winter to spend their time in this area to, to, to get out of the boreal areas that they breed in, which they do go back to in the spring. But they're, the male is very colorful. Again, they're about the size of a, smaller than a blue jay, but they're a good sized bird. And uh, they're fairly plentiful and you'll see them around the feeding stations. This is the female. Not as colorful, but still pretty in its own way. Also, you have evening grosbeaks. This is a male evening grosbeak. And this was actually, uh, I think I took this picture at the visitor center. There are several feeders at the visitor center and uh, there, there are quite a few birds around the visitor center as well. Uh, so that's a good place to stop to, to see a lot of these pathogens. And, uh, and you'll see the uh, gross beaks, you'll see pine gross beaks there, boreal chickadees, um, which is an, another bird that's fun to see, uh, and red poles, 
uh, and the list goes on. There's also an, uh, it's an emu, I think they call it, or an ermine. There's a white one there that usually is, stays around the visitor center, which is a weasel. And it's pretty fun to watch. It will crawl up around the cars and hide behind the logs and stuff and looking for food. Then red-breasted red nuthatches are pretty common. You can hear them meeping all around. And uh, along with, uh, with uh, many other species uh, of birds. And uh, so this is a common. And you can see he is by the peanut butter, which volunteers go out every day. And they even ask visitors if you have peanut butter. And it looks like the, there's not much on the tree. Then go put a big slather of peanut butter on the on the trees that's welcome the birds uh, love the peanut butter another one of the uh, red breast and nut hatch this is another bird that uh, is fun to see uh, the the red wing the white wing crossbill there's also the, the red ring crossbills there too, but these, these guys uh, are usually found along the road near the feeding stations or feeding on grit. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen one, their, their bills are crossed at the end because they're designed to break open pine cones to eat the insides. Uh, these birds actually, we see them here in Northwest Ohio in the winter occasionally. And, uh, but they're a fun bird to see. And they're fairly plentiful uh, in the area during the winter uh, around the bog itself. Of course, the raven. Uh, it's hard to really describe the raven. Uh, it looks like a crow, but it's gigantic. I mean, it's the size of a red-tailed hawk. And they're very loud. They're very skittish. Even in your car, they usually, a quarter mile away, they usually bounce ahead of you if they hear you coming. But there are quite a few uh, ravens in the area, and you'll see them flying by and, and calling their distinctive low tone call. They're a fun, uh, fun bird to, to, to see. Also turkeys. Uh, this is a smoked, I think you call it smoked phase, wild turkey. Wild turkeys uh, are common, and you see uh, you don't see a lot of them, but you do see them roaming along the roads and in the snow. This was actually at a place called Mary Lou's, uh, which is a bird feeding station. Mary Lou, it's at her house. They have a series of feeders up around their house. They welcome birders to park in the driveway. They even have a porta potty there. And they just ask for donations uh, to help maintain and buy the seed. But it's a wonderful place to go see a variety of birds. It's in the northwest corner of the bog, just outside of the bog, not too far. But it's a, it's a, it's a must-see stop, Mary Lou's. This is a common red pole. And they are common <coughs> at the bog. And you'll see flocks of them along the road or at the feeding stations and the uh, fairly easy to find these guys. Sometimes mixed amongst them, you'll see a hoary red pole, which is a little lighter in color. Um, they don't, I think they stop classifying it as a unique species, but people still look for the hoary red pole. Cedar waxwings are pretty, but the bohemian waxwing is by far uh, Pretty. It's, it's just a gorgeous bird. It, it, it's so colorful. And uh, these folks, uh, these birds will show up uh, in the winter, even in Michigan in some places in the UP. But it's hard to find them. But when you do find them, you don't find one, you find 100. They're usually in flocks of 100 to 2,000. It just depends. This is actually outside the bog, north of Duluth, on a road called Knife River Road. And it's a known area for bo uh, Bohemian waxwings. And when we rolled up, there were probably about 70 of them in the trees around us. There's berry bushes there, and they were just feasting on these berry bushes. But that's a fun bird to find. I, you don't normally see them at the bog unless you, there's a little town on the south side of the bog called Meadowlands. 
and there's a couple of uh, old cherry trees in there and sometimes they will uh, light there and feed on those trees but they're a little harder to find this is a bird that's sought after it's a woodpecker this is a black backed woodpecker i think this is a female and this was uh, they feed on these tamarack trees and they peel the bark off anywhere you see these trees and this red bark exposed where they peel off bark that's where the habitat is most that's their habitat and that's where you'll most likely find them uh some of the walking boardwalks the nelson the Nelson bog is one you can walk and you can hear them tapping on the trees and if you get lucky you'll see them but uh, fairly easy to find. Uh, this is a bird that uh, a lot of people come up to look for. The black back woodpecker. This is one that people like to find which is this is really difficult to find. This is a female American three toed woodpecker. Uh, they are there in much smaller numbers and he, I only found this because Judd Brink who was a guide there called me while I was there he was with a group and he said Mark if you want to see American three-toed woodpecker here it is it's over here and he waited till I got there and he pointed it out to me this is a juvenile northern goshawk Goshawks uh, uh, live year round throughout the bog. I've seen the uh, you know adult males flying. I've gotten some distant pictures of them, but this is a juvenile northern goshawk, and this this is the largest of the occipiter family. So occipiters are uh, they have long tails, so they can shorter wings, so they can maneuver through trees quickly. The smallest occipiter is the sharp shin hawk. And then you go up to the, uh, the Cooper's hawk, which is a, an occipiter. And then you have you have these these goshawks. Uh, and this hawk is the size of a red-tailed hawk, so they are not small. They are a big, and they're an apex predator at the bog. This is called the butcher bird, uh, the northern shrike, and we actually see northern shrike in Ohio in the winter. Uh, there's always a couple in the area. Ottawa Wildlife Refuge has northern shrike. The McGee Marsh has northern shrike in the winter. These birds are the impalers. They, they catch their prey, which would include voles, and then they impale them onto a, a barb, a, a thorn, so they can then eat them. And they're very good at hunting. They're fairly large. Uh, I would say the size of a blue jay are a little bit smaller, but they're easy to find because these guys sit on the tops. Of trees. So if you're driving along a road, look at the tops and you, they're always up on top as that's their vantage point so they can look for prey. There's another northern strike demonstrating that they like to sit on top. This is a fun bird. They're a little harder to find, but the boreal chickadee. It's smaller than the black capped chickadee. And uh, the last two years we've gone, I have photographed them at the end of the trail that's behind the visitor center. There is a hiking trail that's maintained and it's about a mile out. You walk to the end of it, there's a feeding station. And there's always at least two boreal chickadees there, at least the last two years there have been. And they're a fun bird to see. They just, uh, hard to find sometimes so if you want to see one go to the visitor center and hike the trail to the end and you can ask somebody at the visitor center they'll tell you if they're down there or not because they they do know so the owls and this is why everybody comes to the bog they come i went to the bog because i wanted to see the owls specifically the great gray owl but we'll get to him later we're going to have some other owls there are many owls at the bog Northern sawwit owl. I've seen them on three different occasions, three different trips. Uh, and they're a small owl, about the size of a grapefruit. And they uh, will spend their winters in the bog. You can also find them in 
you know, Northwest Ohio in the winter and Southeastern Michigan. They, they like to stay close to a, an open flyway. So they're usually in a bush or a tree that's along a trail or a road because they want quick, they want uh, to be able to quickly fly out and fly back in. And they roost during the day. Best way to find them is look for whitewash. Um, because they usually stay with the same roost uh, for several days. And if they do, the, the pine needles, the bark, the ground will have whitewash all over it. And if you follow the whitewash up, your eyes usually connect with the eyes of a Solwit owl. Here's another Solwit uh, sunning along the road. Again, very small. Easy, easy to pass by and not see. Of course, the great horned owl is there. And I've seen several great horned owls during my eight years of visiting. Caught this one at sunset as we were driving back to Duluth. I saw it in a tree. And I'm shooting with, uh, just so you know, I'm shooting um, my camera equipment for those that are interested. Um, I use, this is a 600 millimeter F4 prime lens. So it's highly cropped. So I'm quite a ways from this owl, but I shoot with Nikon, uh, currently shoot with the new Z9 mirrorless camera. And uh, it's a wonderful camera. And I have a, I have a new uh, a mirrorless uh, 400 2.8 lens and I have my 600 still, I have a 500 PF, which is a nice small prime lens that's easy to travel with. So that, that's my basic equipment that I use. And I freehand most of my shots. I very rarely use a tripod. Barred owls are very common in the bog. There's a couple places that you can see them. And, and usually if you, you, you'll hear somebody talking about it and people are very friendly. If you hear somebody mentioning uh, a bird or just asking people yeah, what have you seen they're happy to share the information all that we birders ask is that people are respectful of the owls maintain distance don't taunt them don't chase them um, there are some bad actors at the bog uh, i came upon a guy that was baiting a northern hawk owl to get him to fly to him and it and it and that's how we found out the owl was flying directly at this guy every time and here he had a bucket of mice so uh the the the, the dnr of minnesota were called but the guy fled before they got there another picture of a barred owl they look a little different than the barred owls we see around northwest ohio or the ones i see in florida they look like these guys look like they're pretty cold Another favorite is the northern hawk owl, and that is a migrant, and it comes down in the winter. And uh, one thing about owls I mentioned here is that uh, owls travel south for food. And if there's enough food in the area that they're coming from, they, they'll stay there. But if they need food, they'll move south to places like the Saxon bog. So some years we have very few migratory owls that come to the sex in bog and then there are a few resident owls that stay there year round specifically a great gray owl there's at least four or five of them that stay year round but some years they call them eruption years many owls will come down um, one year i saw probably four northern hawk owls in the area this past year, winter, I didn't see one. So it just depends on food sources available in their home area. And if they have limited food sources, they will move south and spend their time in other areas. And the bog is one area that the northern hawk owl will visit. Northern hawk owls are sight hunters, unlike other owls who use hearing. I mean, northern hawk owls use their, their hearing, but their primary a hunting technique is is visual and so they sit at the tops of trees that makes them a little easier to find and they scan the area for 
rodents, uh, voles specifically, and they hunt from these high perches. This owl is about the size of, uh, it's smaller than a barred owl, but bigger than a um, screech, northeastern screech owl. They're not very big. Here's another picture of a northern hawk owl. Here's one giving me the evil eye, the stink eye. I was in my car and he flew up and landed on the wire right above me. So I had to oblige and take its picture because I thought that's what it wanted. Here's one that's flying off a telephone pole, went by me and then flew into the snow out at, way out in a field. And I assume it caught a vole because it stayed there and I could see it working on something. Snowy owls too are, are in the area. The bog itself is not really the right habitat for snowy owls, but there are areas around the bog, uh, specifically along, uh, around, along County Road 7, which runs north-south on the eastern side of the bog. Uh, the last two years there's been a snowy owl in that area. Uh, so there, uh, and then also in Duluth, I, we were walking to dinner one night uh, and a snowy owl flew right over our head through the city, through the, by the buildings out to the lakefront. So they are there. Uh, you just don't normally see a snowy owl on these trips. This is the, for people that like to see owls, this is one of the prizes uh, and one of the most sought after species of owl. This is a boreal owl. And these guys are migratory and they only come down when there's lack of food and they spend their winter in the area. And they spend their winter along the north coast of uh, the, uh, Lake Superior. This was just north of Duluth one year. I didn't see a boreal owl last year, but the year before was a wonderful year to see, a, see boreal owls. I saw two. This is the this was the star of the show two years ago at the Admiral Road feeding station. This boreal owl would come out every day for about two and a half, three weeks and spend its day right at the feeding station because it was opportunity to, to grab a vole that was feeding on the grains and the seeds that were dropped on the snow below. And so this guy was the star attraction. And uh, I mean, this is along the road. And so, you know, people, while I was there, people were extremely respectful and maintained a safe distance. This is a highly cropped image, a 600 millimeter lens. And uh, we saw it for, we spent about, a, a, you know, 40 minutes with it uh, and just watching it and took some pictures. And it was a wonderful opportunity. You just don't normally see boreal owls, but I'm always looking for boreal owls. And they're about the size a little bit bigger than a northern sawwed owl, not much. So they're bigger than a grapefruit. They're smaller than an eastern screech owl. And this is that same owl. And every day, I guess he showed up and then one day he was gone and never came back. So uh, that was a great opportunity. I remember when I got the call, somebody called me while I was there and said, the boreal owl is out. And we had an opportunity to get over there in time to see it, which was wonderful. So this brings me to the owl that most people come to see, and that's the great gray owl. So they said there are about four resident great gray owls at the sex in bog. And, uh, and then, then there's some that visit uh, during, the, during the winter, come from the north because of food. One year we were there, and one afternoon I saw 14 great gray owls in three hours. So that was a kind of an eruption year. There was a year several years ago, I don't know the exact date, but I think in the late 90s or early 2000s, there was a great gray owl but on every tree, on every fence post, everywhere you look. There were so many of them, and they were in town. They were outside of town. They were sitting on signs. And uh, this last year, there were only resident owls. And this is, this is how you find them. You, usually, you see them usually the best times to go find them. You get out to the bog at first light 
and you start driving the known areas, which is Ro County Road 7, Admiral Road uh, north and south of the feeders are two areas that you look for them. And you drive slowly. And my wife is a great spotter. And as I drive slowly down these roads, she can see the silhouettes. And she caught this silhouette and said, stop, back up. I think I have one. And sure enough, there, there the owl sat. And we sat there till first light uh, to get some good looks at it. And at the time, there were some other uh, folks in the area. Uh, I called a, a birding tour guide and told him that it was here. So his people had a chance to see it. But it was... This is how you find them. And I, I have better luck early in the morning, but you can see them at dusk as well. It's a big owl. It's the tallest owl in North America. It is, gosh, it is every bit of three feet tall. But it's not as heavy as the great horned owl. These owls are, when you, it's, this picture doesn't do it justice, but these owls look like they weigh 20 pounds, but in fact, they're three to four pounds. That's all feathers. Under, that feather, uh, under those feathers is a very slender body. Uh, the feathers are there to keep them warm. And they, are, they hunt by sound. I mean, they can hear a, mole, a vole in the snow, two feet under the snow at 100 yards. And they'll just take off from a perch and they'll dive right in the snow. And you'll see a couple of pictures and grab one. It's amazing. This one was shot along uh, just north of two harbors along Forest Service Road number two. There were two of them up there and we had heard about it. So we went up there and camped out. And sure enough, one showed up and gave us some opportunities to get some good looks. And when you're looking for owls, one of the things you want to look for is cars pulled off along the road. And that you find a lot of them that way. Somebody will see an owl and they'll park and then somebody else will park and then you'll have a group of people. And so that's another way of finding them. Here's a great gray owl going off his perch and going after prey right at this point. He has found the prey and now he's kind of hovering over it and he's getting ready to pounce. And when they fly, they I, if you're in their way, they fly right at you because they're going past you to get to their prey. As you can see, they can get, now this is cropped of course, but they can get quite close to you. And they really, uh, as long as people are respectful and silent and keep their distance, they hunt while you stand there. They do their normal thing. So he spotted the sound where the sound's coming from, and they dive, they dive in like an osprey going in after a fish. They go straight down. And sometimes they don't get their prey. Sometimes they do. And here he has grabbed a bowl. And they immediately swallow that vole whole, and then they head back to their perch. And they come off the perch again, going after another one. It's a wonderful owl, and uh, it's one that uh, if you've never seen uh, and, you're, and you want to see one, this is the place to go in the winter to find them. They're there, and if you're patient, you do your research, you'll find one. And it's a wonderful owl to see. It's, uh, you know, well, the first time we saw one, uh, and it, was a, it was an unreal experience, just amazing to see him. That's it, folks. Any questions for me? Well, Mark, this has been absolutely inspiring. Um, I, I want to interject that you mentioned that the owls aren't here in the summer because they're, I presume they're getting food sources up north. And when the, the fall, when the winter sets in in Canada, the, the food sources 
dry up so they come down here. Is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, they're breeding grounds. Uh, like I said, there are four or five resident great grays at the bog, but many of them show up in the winter because the food sources, uh, the, if they have a good breeding season and they have a lot of owls in the area, they need a specific amount of territory to hunt in. And if that territory is taken by another owl, then the younger ones are forced to start moving south to look for territories to feed in. And that then will drive them, you know, to places like the sex in bog for the winter months. Well, thank you. So folks, what questions do you have for Mark? We're, we're, we have a few minutes left and uh, we would certainly like to uh, hear what you want to know. Uh, is anybody planning to make a trip to the bog in, in the near future? I, I was just there. My wife, Mary, and I were just there uh, about um, a week and a half ago. And uh, we didn't see all this good stuff that Mark pointed out. But um, there are birds there in the summertime. And... Um, haven't uh, ventured out in the winter time yet, but I think that's going to be in our bucket list. Yeah, you need to do that trip. Uh, the summertime, well, I need to do the summer trip because it is a great nesting area for warblers, specifically the Connecticut warbler and the golden wing warbler, uh, the black burning warbler, and there's a couple other that nest there. Uh, and you find them by their call. You have to listen for them. Then you can put your muck boots on and you can head out if it's a public area and you can try to find them. But uh, I would like to see the actually the flowers. I do macro photography too. I just started doing that and it's a great place to do macro photography. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I wish to thank you, Mark, for this wonderful presentation and everyone who joined us, all 10 of you. I, again, I remind you that our full program calendar is available on our Ottawa National Wildlife Reb, uh, Refuge website. Just look for events and you'll see the whole calendar for the rest of the year. And we, we would like to, to you to join us at other pro, uh, virtual events <clears throat> online and certainly in person. The, the refuge is opening up. And Tom, I see somebody does have a question here about snowstorms. Have I ever been caught in snowstorms there? And the answer is yes. <laughs> okay. um, and it is uh, if it snows you just need to make sure you can get out uh the snow is pretty it's wonderful but this it, it's serious snow when it snows there well thanks for that mark um you were are because you re registered for this program all of you are going to get a link to take the uh, the survey of the program please give us some feedback and even people who didn't attend but registered will get the the, the uh, survey. We'll get the recording with the survey on it. So I thank you all again for uh, for attending. Thank you, Mark, for presenting. I, I bid you all a, a great day. Yeah, thank you so much, folks. You bet. Bye bye now. <laughs>